Hi all. Um, so we have with us today, we are honored and privileged to have with us today, uh, Kathy Kelly and Buddy Bell and Kathy Breen of Voices for Creative Nonviolence. Uh, Kathy, uh, we all know Kathy Kelly has uh, been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. She's been in the book of truth tellers. Uh, she is uh, just a longtime advocate for peace and justice and for those whose voices uh, no one else is listening to. So uh, I, um, she has been 12 times, I guess she said, uh, to Afghanistan. And Buddy's been with her a number of times in the last few years. And so they're going to talk to you. Uh, first, uh, they're going to talk to you about their experience in his experiences in Afghanistan, the people they met there, and the situation that's been caused by the wars there. And also, they'll talk a little about um, social choices that we have here in this country uh, as to whether uh, how we're going to spend our resources. Are we going to spend our resources destroying? or building. And so they'll uh, talk to you about that too. And we also have with us, as I said, Kathy Breen. And um, Kathy has been going to Iraq with uh, Kathy Kelly since um, since the Iraq War, since uh, the time of the sanctions before the Iraq War in 2003. Uh, and they have been observing the situation there, and for a long time I know that they were bringing, during the sanctions, they were bringing in assistance for the people of Iraq, and uh, it was always one of my favorite heroic stories that uh, Voices in the Wilderness, as they called themselves at the time, was fined for violating the sanctions, because they were taking food and medicine and uh, warm clothes in for the people in Iraq at a time when they were being denied these most basic human resources uh, as a, you know, because they might be used for a warlike purpose somehow. So um, it's really very sad, some of the things our country does. And Kathy Breen just got, uh, she was in Iraq uh, in November, and I think again this spring, talking to people, talking to people about what's happening there now, is the war really over? And also uh, talking to the refugees, people who went to Syria and had to come back because of the war there, people who have been in Jordan. So, uh, what what kind of uh, what kind of struggle have these people had since we uh, more or less uh, destroyed the infrastructure of their country? So I'm going to not speak on any further. Instead, I'm going to call uh, Buddy. Buddy, do you want to go first, Kathy? Okay, before with Buddy. Kathy is going. Kathy Kelly is going to come up here, and she's going to speak to you. And uh, so let's have a nice warm welcome for Kathy. Well, thank you all of you for coming tonight. It's really, uh, for me, always a pleasure to come to your city. Uh, there's a great deal of hospitality that I've grown to expect here, and we're very, very grateful. Um, I suppose people might sometimes wonder, well, what you know, what motivates people to go over to these places that are um, off the beaten track in a sense and um, uh, might seem so unpredictable. Uh, so I, I, I have one story that I'd like to tell. It's not uh, a story that has anything to do with the effects of the United States militarism and warfare on Afghanistan, but um, it's, it's a story that it tells a lot to me about what could be, what could be possible. Uh, I don't know where I got it from, but it, and I would say an almost neurotic level, I developed a fear of edges. Like, I would be on a train track in Chicago, and a mother would be there with three of her children, and I'd be trying to pull the children back from the edge, thinking, oh, it's, you're too close to the edge. And it, it really was a distorted sense of fear about edges. So when I first went to the central highlands of Afghanistan in a province called Bamyan, and the young people said, oh, we're going to take you out to our mountain villages now. I was very excited to go to the mountain villages and very petrified of the edges. And I was quite proud of myself. I'd done pretty well with a lot of up and down and jagged. And um, we got to what could only as a waterway maybe best be identified as a stream, but fairly deep. 
And the passage across it looked to me like something the size of a pencil. And I just thought, I can't do it. <laughs> and so the left foot was not going in front of the right, and the kids finally realized she's stuck. <laughs> she's not going anywhere. And so they, I don't quite know how they did it, but um, they, were, they were trying, one was trying to move my ankle, and the other was trying to maneuver me. And finally, Feis, who was dressed all in white that day, jumped into the water, put up his arms, and said, my grandmother, I catch you. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what brings me back to Afghanistan. My grandmother, I catch you. And I think there's so much of that mutual catching and overcoming fears and catching courage from one another and finding guidance that's almost infinitely possible. And somehow we get caught into this other way of bombing, of menacing, of night raiding, of hog tying, of imprisoning, of interrogating. We get caught into this other way of looking the other way and somehow not noticing acute malnourishment and women dying in childbirth and water that can't be drunk or what widows and orphans getting pushed up the mountainside where there isn't any water at all. We somehow even get lulled into believing that it's a humanitarian war. What a hideous oxymoron, a humanitarian war. And so the long and arduous process, Kathy will talk about it with regard to Iraq. Many of you know of it with regard to Central and South America. Uh, we know about it with regard to the neighborhood right here and now, with the <coughs> war against the poor that's exacerbated because we keep allowing the military, like sort of a, a vacuum, a hideous vacuum to keep taking our resources, our ingenuity, our problem-solving abilities. So I'm right with the new pope. War no more, he says, abandon the futility of war. He comes out and he says, stop this war. And I think that's much of what we need, the spirit of belief that things can change, that nonviolence can change the world, and that we should never let inconvenience get in the way of acting in accord with what we believe. And then, of course, I, I needn't say anything to any of you about desiring to live simply and be of service to others. And that, I think, is, is much of the solution to all of our war making. So thank you very much for your time. We'll be very eager to have discussion and dialogue, questions, other ideas, and we're very grateful for the chance to be uh, perhaps part of a wider audience that might be viewing this in the future. So. Uh, let me ask Buddy to come forward, and uh, Buddy Bell has uh, gone to Afghanistan uh, quite without Kathy Kelly, and um, then um, really to the Afghan Peace Volunteers, I think a kind of a combination, brother, father, friend. So. Well, uh, one of my first, well, the first time that I was uh, in Afghanistan, and I, I was talking to 15-year-old Abdullah. Um, he asked me, is this your first time in a backward country? And it made me, t took me aback, and it reminds me of a, a, a slogan that uh, people used to say in some of the Chicago demonstrations I had been part of as, as a young adult, uh, pushing for more access to food stamps, more ac access to health care, more access to uh, uh, public transportation. It's not that people are falling through the cracks, they're getting pushed through the cracks. And it's not that people maybe in Afghanistan are falling off the edge, they're being pushed over the edge, to use Kathy's um, story. And uh, we, have to, we have to think about the, the things that our government does that it doesn't make the news. It doesn't make the news that we dropped cluster bombs over Afghanistan in 2001, and these over 9% of the little bomblets don't explode when they hit the ground. Uh, if, if there's a child uh, playing nearby, they may be attracted by a, a glint of light off of, from the sunlight off of this ball. Uh, they may pick it up and lose an arm, lose an eye, lose a life. 
they're being pushed over the edge. And um, just like that, we've almost, we're 12 years uh, into the war in Afghanistan. Um, we haven't, we haven't improved situations uh, for regular people in Afghanistan uh, by any sense. There's, there's still uh, many people dying of hunger, many people dying of uh, bombs, afraid to go to the next town. Um, as one of the women told me, uh, she was uh, her brother had died and she had to go a short distance to Khazni from Kabul. Her family said, don't come. Don't come because uh, you, could, you could die on the way. You might hit a roadside bomb. You might hit a landmine. You might get uh, abducted. In 12 years, all, we've, all the U.S. has done in Afghanistan is uh, give people reasons to join militant groups, not, and a lot of people only think of the Taliban, but there's many other groups. Um, the reasons are unemployment. Afghanistan has 35% unemployment, according to the CIA, or according to students at Kabul University, who I stayed with, it's about 50%. Uh, and this is exacerbated because of the war, because of the lack of funding, the lack of uh, investment in human sectors, in the healthcare sector, in the education sector, in the agricultural sector. Um, those cluster bombs I told you about, along with landmines, they uh, restrict access to up to 50% of the arable land. Um, so in a country that was uh, where agriculture took most of the economy for their entire history. Um, a lot of people are unable to work because of that. When you have that much unemployment, you have people who tell us we're going crazy because we cannot feed our children. Um, what, what happens when uh, someone is a father or a brother sees someone, a young child dying, and someone says, well, you could join a this group and they'll pay you a little bit uh, to either pick up a gun or dig a hole to uh, put a roadside bomb there or to act as a lookout. Um, this is the whole system that's pushing Afghans over the edge. And another reason that uh, many people are joining militant groups is because we've had, uh, well, Afghanistan is uh, the source of 93% of the world's opium. The U.S., they, they spend money on uh, drug interdiction. They'll, they'll burn a, a heroin field, but just beyond it is another heroin field, another opium field, excuse me. And um, this is the, the source of all the militants' uh, cash flow. Um, there hasn't been investment in the kind of reconstruction to the irrigation system which would enable farmers to go back to growing fruits and vegetables. Uh, there hasn't been any, any sort of uh, insurance program to, so that farmers can take their crops to market um, and not have to lose a whole crop because uh, they can't pay a toll to one of the uh, groups that controls that road who wants them to grow heroin. They have uh, even, they will give um, a loan to a farmer and to be paid off in future crops. Uh, and this is, the real solutions to this kind of system are not being pursued. We're not pursuing investment uh, that would go to that, those sectors that could employ people, those sectors that could feed people, the kind of investment that looks for the human-oriented society rather than the thing-oriented society. And um, also, it was my first trip, uh, uh, one of the 
women who a friend is a, a friend of Kathy's had come over, and we and I asked her, um, what do you think about the the U.S. claim that we're the troops are in Afghanistan um, to protect the women of Afghanistan? She said, uh, protect us. They're the ones doing all the killing. And it's true sometimes literally, it's true sometimes figuratively, because as long as the U.S. is in Afghanistan, militant groups say they will keep fighting. Uh, that's another major reason um, that there is still violence in Afghanistan is because the U.S. Uh, is actually there. There's a large um, uh, idea among many people that it's self-defense to fight against an occupying army. Um, and so the Afghan Peace Volunteers, this group of young people who came to Kabul from Bamiyan, and they've also um, collected some other youth from different provinces, uh, some of the families that make up the 400 average people a day, according to <coughs> Amnesty International, there's 400 people a day who come to the capital from other parts of the country because of the uh, rampant violence there. Uh, but even in Kabul, it isn't always safe. There's always the chance that uh, you may come across a bomb uh, placed somewhere. And this happened um, last summer. Uh, across the street from the Afghan Peace Volunteers' house, there was a bomb that went off uh, because right across the street was the Afghan uh, Independent Human Rights Commission. And this was a commission that the Karzai, government of President Karzai had been pressured to set up. They did a, a nationwide study of crimes committed both during the U.S. occupation, during the Taliban rule, and during the Civil War period um, after the uh, fall of the communist government. Um, and did it go before that too? Yes. Uh, through to um, even when uh, Russia was occupying Afghanistan. <coughs> they compiled a, a whole report and they were going to release the report, but we, we know that in Parliament in Afghanistan there are many uh, representatives from warlord groups, uh, drug uh, groups, some militant groups who have representatives in Parliament, one of whom said that the person who made that report should be shot 30 times in the face. He said that to a reporter who was asking him about the report and his presence in that report. Uh, and they got President Karzai to block the report from being released. Um, so the Afghan Peace Volunteers have made a, they've made several two to three minute movies and one of them, uh, they, this explosion across the street had shattered all their windows in the, in the building and um, they immediately started taping and talking about their response and uh, how they were reacting to this incident. Can we turn off these lights? I don't know.
یعنی می شیشا ایران می بینه اینجا اونا دوباره هم مرخواد من پت سوسی طرف گذاره کنم Speaking at the end of that video um, is one of the, the um, teachers of, of a seamstress seeing techniques in a seamstress collective which uh, was started with the Afghan Peace Volunteers um, about a year ago uh, and they, they make things together um, the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers help them to market the things that they make because uh, if you're a woman, it's, it's hard uh, to get the same price for something as, as a man would get. Um, so you could, you could see that she wasn't um, comfortable uh, having her, her face filmed, um, so all you saw was her hand. Um, and these are, well, the mores that exist and, and the um, social um, codes that exist in Afghan society um, were in Afghanistan long before the Taliban. It was not a creation of the Taliban. And when the U.S. claims that they're um, fighting the war, uh, in order to liberate women, just think about uh, women like Shakira in, in the end, how she said, well, when a bomb goes off, I don't know where my son is. Uh, I don't know where uh, my family members are. Are they on the street? It was such a large explosion. Um, are they okay? And uh, really, the, the war itself negates any, any kind of um, uh, other liberations that, that the U.S. claims to have made which haven't actually come to, to be. Um, and as well, they, they don't take certain simple steps to make life easier for women. They don't put the money that we spend over two billion dollars per week according to someone in the Pentagon who testified before uh, the U.S. Senate. They don't put any of that money uh, into building clinics, for example, um, which would lower the maternal mortality rate or the infant mortality rate, both of which are, uh, for Afghanistan, um, are some of the highest rates in the world. Uh, they don't put money into building wells uh, in refugee camps in small towns where women have to walk a mile, sometimes downhill, uh, or, or walk an hour, sorry, downhill, and uh, pick up water from a stream and chug, chug that all the way back up the, up the, the hill back home. Uh, if there were wells built, not only would it be safer because it wouldn't come from a well, but it would free up a lot of uh, time for women. And women are, uh, it's mostly women who do most of the chores in any 
uh, Afghan household. So these are, these are simple things that we're trying to, as, as uh, people who have come back from Afghanistan, um, we often have the idea that we want to bring back uh, the stories. We want to bring back the stories and we also want to advocate um, on behalf of the people that we meet in Afghanistan. Um, so what we're doing uh, for this tour, which is taking us to Rochester, and it's my first time here, I'm really glad to be here. Um, but we've got a bean pole in the back. We're bringing up this, this idea that the U.S. is responsible for uh, paying two Afghans something uh, to not to uh, make up for the 12 years of war in Afghanistan, but something that uh, means that we have, we take the responsibility to do something um, because we've been there 12 years and we haven't improved things. Uh, so we want to push for this idea that U.S. owes reparations to <laughs> Afghanistan, like it owes reparations to many other countries and many communities within the U.S. as well. Um, and we're talking about this in, in different speaking events like here, and we're bringing this bean pole, which is on the table back there. One, one jar signifies Pentagon spending, and one jar signifies reparations and reconstruction spending. And as people take some beans and put them in either jar, um, we talk to them about the issue we get them thinking, we get them um, considering what is, what is the next steps that I would take uh, in order to bring, bring this to pass. I mean, those are just beans, but they're a symbol of what, what people can do. Uh, and it starts with wherever you're at, whatever your comfort level is, uh, talking to uh, family and friends, talking to uh, people at work, <coughs> participating in a, an action, in a protest, or organizing one, or writing an article. Um, all of these things we're trying to get people to do, and as, as part, a small part of the whole, we're going to put pressure on the government. That's the only way that the government will actually take a system of reparations, is if the people demand it. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. The uh, young young man who is playing the recorder in this mo in this um, video, uh, his cousin um, Ali taught me a song. Uh, actually, it has to do with going up on the mountain and playing your flute. Um, go, I'm going up on the mountain and playing my flute for peace. Asta li kai bala nai me adana man ke telhu ashki me hoham jahan kai me fama. And hoham jahan, in all the world kai me fama. Who will understand? And the idea of voices and the idea of the Afghan peace volunteers is to bridge the divide uh, between people in different countries, between dif people in different uh, ethnic groups, and bring some understanding, bring stories, and uh, hopefully spread the understanding, spread this um, passion for justice. And um, I'm going to leave it to Kathy now. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about Iraq. It's um, a pleasure to be here. It's also my first time in Rochester. And it's especially nice to be here coming up on the mega bus from New York City and seeing some of the fall colors. It's just very beautiful. I feel very estranged from nature being in New York City. So, And I, I'm very glad. I must have brought the warm weather because it's usually colder, I think, at this time of year up here. 
At least these are the reports we get down in New York City. Mm -hmm. that, um, did, this is a cold you. place. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, maybe just a little background. Uh, Abby, can you speak a little louder? A little louder. Can you hear me? Let me if know you if you can. can't hear, why don't you all move up closer? Um, I actually went to Iraq for the first time in 2002. Uh, Kathy invited me to think about becoming part of the Iraq Peace Team, which was a sub-project of Voices in the Wilderness. Uh, the, the thought being, the war was getting very, seemed very imminent, and uh, the Iraq Peace Team was formed with the intention of, in the case of uh, an invasion, the Iraq War, perhaps we would be allowed to stay and walk alongside of ordinary people. And so I had that privilege of being able to go in the fall of 2002 and stay on uh, through shock and awe together with Kathy and others, not just from the United States, but from Korea, Japan. Uh, our hope was to, with the larger global population, to stop the war, but unfortunately that was not the case. And now, Iraq is not even on the map anymore, on our screen. Uh, with the troop pullout in, in the end of 2011, it seems that the general consensus is that the war is over in Iraq. And so, as Buddy was saying, one of the things we try to do is bear witness to what's happening in Iraq. And I can assure you that the war is far from over. Um, some of us were able to go back in 2003 under the occupation. Uh, I went back about eight, and Kathy as well, and others, about eight months into the uh, U.S. occupation, uh, U.S.-led occupation. and. Uh, the UN had already been bombed, the truck bomb, and pulled out, and, and the kidnappings and assassinations had started, and the violence began to become very rampant, random and rampant. And, and as voices, we made the decision in 2004 that we could no longer go to central or southern uh, Iraq. We would put Iraqis in danger who were associated with us, mm -hmm. just by their mere association, as our country was occupying theirs. So from that point on, I, uh, as part of Voices, we began to follow Iraqi refugees who fled to Jordan and Syria, and I did that until 2011, um, and met many refugees. Uh, uh, and I, I just want to say something about this is a very unusual presentation for me tonight, and an upsetting presentation, because for me it's always been important to put faces with stories. And now the situation in Iraq is so violent and so precarious and dangerous for people in Iraq that I really can't put the faces up anymore. I'm afraid to. So there's very few faces of pictures that I have taken on my last two trips to Iraq. We were able to go back in October, November of last year to Iraq for six weeks. And it was the first time I had returned in nine years. And so mm -hmm. this is a picture, for instance, that I took in Najaf. Uh, and this is the uh, Euphrates River, which comes from uh, Syria and feeds sort of the western part of the country. Very, very polluted. Don't let the beautiful, tranquil scene deceive you. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of Iraqi refugees that I, I mean, I have, we have many, many pictures, but I just got So one family that I got very close to, uh, and who are actually back in Baghdad now because the situation in Syria became so dangerous for them, they had to flee back to Baghdad. But when I was in Syria with this family, I knew them over a period of about three years, and we were trying to help them resettle to the United States. And on one trip to their uh, apartment in Damascus, they showed me the fifth-year-old history book, and sure enough, there's the United States. We're, we're represented in the Syrian textbook, and this is Abu Ghraib. And this is Iraqi, Iraqi uh, prisoners being tortured. Mm -hmm. And this is another picture in the same textbook of an, a, a U.S. soldier with his foot on the, his boot on the neck of Iraq, an Iraqi man, and other Iraqis face down, which is a very, very commonplace thing that happened to many, many Iraqi men. Um, so that's the Euph Euphrates, as I said, and the next picture is the Tigris. Yes, this is Baghdad, the sun setting. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Well, these are the pictures. You'll, uh, forgive me, you'll, uh, I'll just have to ask you to bear with me because this is acting up a little bit. But I wanted to bring you Baghdad today. I wanted to bring us back and center us. Pictures and facts that we just don't hear in the media. And so this is what Baghdad would look like today where explosions are just taking place um, in, a, in a, <coughs> a very distressing... Uh, Amount. Here again are street sellers. Children looking on. I recently watched the movie Gandhi. <laughs> it seems to help lift me out of uh, depression and inspire me, and so, and out of discouragement. And in the film, Gandhi speaks to the British who were occupying India, and he said, "Your masters in someone else's home. It's time you left." He's also quoted as saying to his fellow compatriots, "We must have the courage to take their anger." And as I watched, I thought, "What do I do about my own anger?" You know, what do I do about my own rage? Because for years, I, I feel I've had to try to focus and concentrate on anger management and how to deal with my own anger. Um, you probably know that Tuesday, September 24th, Obama addressed the UN. And he was given 15 minutes, and he took 43 minutes. And one of the things he said was that the danger for the world is not an America that is too eager to immerse itself in the affairs of other countries or to take on every problem in the regime as its own. The danger for the world is that the U.S., um, after a decade of war, rightly concerned about issues back home, aware of the hostility that our engagement in the region has engendered throughout the Muslim world, may disengage, creating a vacuum of leadership that no other nation is ready to fill. And he went on to say, I be believe such disengagement would be a mistake. I believe America must remain engaged for our own security, but I also believe, believe the world is better for it. Some may disagree, but I believe America is exceptional, in part because we have shown a willingness through the sacrifice of blood and treasure to stand up not only for our own narrow self-interest, but for the interest of all. Um, I hope this works, yes. Uh, April 15th was a real momentous day for the U.S. On that day, two bombs exploded in Boston, in the Boston Marathon, killing three people. And I got emails and, from friends in Iraq uh, with their condolences and their sadness, we mourn with Boston, expressing their grief and... Uh, I, I wonder how many people know that on the same day, April 15th, it was also a momentous day in Iraq, and I can't help wondering if people knew that, that, the, that 18 bombs went off that day in Iraq, and at least 32 people were killed. Um, and the next day, April, or right after that, on April 23rd, 111 were killed, and on April 24th, 86 were killed. And April 25th, another 96 were killed. And we just don't get these facts. And over 6,000 people have been killed up to this date, this year in Iraq. One of the last images I have leaving uh, to return last October, November to come back to the States was this uh, woman technician and a boy, Mohammed, who's 14, and his father visited the, the house where I was staying, and here they are. And, oh, I, I wanted to say that the day after the Boston blast in the New York Times, the headline read, War Zone at Mile 26, so many people without legs. And when Mohammed was six years old, he's 14 now, he was walking home from school, and he stepped on an electric wire, a pole that was down by a U.S. bomb, and he lost both his legs and both his arms. And 
and the, the doctor you saw, the woman doctor, she made those prostheses for him, and when he puts those on, he can stand and walk. And they came to us wanting to know if we could help him get a simple arm. He, he, his mother went blind when this happened, and she's still blind. And um, he's never been able to touch his nose, to caress somebody, to feed himself. So um, this is a, a picture I did include in Najaf. It's the kids that I think they're so sweet and in this school. Their neighborhood school where I was staying. And this is also the reality of children reading school. This is a, a very holy teacher of Quran. Um, I'm going to sort of skip over that and stay on this picture, I hope. Um, I had the opportunity to visit him one evening, and the next day he traveled with us to Basra. And in the car, we were able to continue our conversation. And I asked him what with a very good translator, if he would be willing for me to, uh, to, to talk with him at a deeper level. He said, of course. And I asked him what he felt the effects of violence has been on Iraqis. And he said that before the Iraq-Iran war from 1980 to 88, I believe that was, people were living peacefully side by side. And the wealthy and the poor alike were sent to the front to fight. And this was the outbreak of violence, he felt. But he said, and I quote him, we consider the American people represented by the soldiers who fight the war against us as war criminals. Mm -hmm. We saw how they were cruel and savage, how they, the tanks ran over innocent people. It became normal for every household to lose loved ones. We saw terrorists whom we caught and handed over to the US troops later released. Many wrongdoings are credited to Islam. The U.S. was wrong to bring terror to Iraq. The Iraqi people are religious. They will become strong and resilient again. Normally, I would show you pictures of a woman translator who went with me to visit a family who had returned from Syria in this area. This is a beautiful area in Baghdad with a, mo a mosque that has two golden domes. And, um, but I'm not going to show her picture. But she uh, was 23 years old, or is 23, and she graduated from a university in Baghdad uh, in English studies. And she was about 13 when the U.S. war broke out. And I asked her how she felt the war has affected her country. And she said, and I'll quote her, people have changed, she said. They think of themselves. It is not good. Things have only gotten worse. Children 8 and 10 years old think of weapons and killing. They do not have the thoughts of children. I would be afraid for my own children growing up in this atmosphere. I have never felt safe since the war. We've forgotten the real meaning of safety. I hope it doesn't get worse, she told me, because it's my country. And this was in November of 2012. I hope for all the good for my country, she said. She wants to be a teacher. She says the mass exodus of the professional class has had a big effect on her generation. I am afraid the level of education is very low, even in the <coughs> colleges, she said. The good teachers have left the country. And, and there are statistics as high as 80% of the professional class began to flee because of assassinations and kidnappings. Uh, not just teachers, but engineers, doctors, and we know this from being in Jordan and Syria. And, um, She wants to teach the new generation in the right way, she said, not as her teachers taught her. I want to do good to positively affect society. I wish the goodness in people becomes greater than the evil. Iraqi people are very kind, but after the war, many changes happened in their psyche. Another young man, an English teacher in a high school from a village, told me the situation is very bad in Iraq. The politicians are corrupt in the whole country. They are looking for their own interests. The regime didn't serve the people, and now the government doesn't either. I see no hope for Iraq. The boys don't want to learn. They have been affected by the war, turned into beasts, he said. They have seen blood and killing. They are violent, with no principles, no respect. So I was invited in... Uh, 
to, get, to sit in on an English lecture, a fifth year university students their last year, and, and they invited me after the lecture to introduce myself and say something, and so I did. It was quite embarrassing. I, I was sort of the honored guest, and so I had told them something about who I was and why I was there, and that it had been nine years since I had been to the country, and I saw that they still had no drinkable water and no national electrical grid, and but I really wanted to hear from them, I said, and, and I, I said, please, and there was complete silence. Nobody spoke. And, and then finally, a young man in the front row said in a quiet voice, um, we have nothing to say. The last years have only been sad ones. And then again, silence, and more silence. And then finally, an impassioned young woman in the middle of the lecture hall spoke up, and it cost her a lot to speak. And she said, and I quote her, you have destroyed everything. You have destroyed our country. You have destroyed our ancient civilization. You have destroyed what is inside of us. You have taken our smiles from us. You have taken our dreams. And another said, Iraqis cannot forget what Americans have done here. They destroyed the childhood. You, do, you don't destroy everything and say, we're sorry. You don't commit crimes and say, sorry. What can you do, they asked me. Another said, in Fallujah, 30% of our babies are born deformed. What can you do? No, it will not be forgotten. It is not written on our hearts. It's engraved on our hearts. And I, I need to emphasize that this was not said with any rancor. This was just said with a deep sorrow and pain. And after, they, they, many of them came forward and said, are you a Christian? Do you know the Quran? Do you, what do you know about Muslims? You know, they asked me with these wide open expressions and yeah, it was hard to leave them. And, and I often think that part of our, our presence in these countries is that they have the opportunity to say something to a US citizen that's not a U.S. soldier for the first time. Mm -hmm. And they need to say it to somebody from our country, not to just anybody. I'm going to show you some pictures of Baghdad. If, uh, whoops. I'll just show you a quick picture. If it comes. I had to wear the hijab. This is sort of a diversionary picture, so you can see here I am in, the, in a marketplace on my way to visit a family. And, but I kept a low profile. I kept my head down my eyes lowered and and they put me usually in the front seat and and because I'm an older woman and they, I'm pale, I, they thought I was sickly and they often just let us go right through the checkpoints, you know, and so my age really worked to my advantage. <laughs> um, but we didn't want to draw attention to ourselves and put the families that were hosting us in danger. It, this I'm going to show you now some pictures from Baghdad. Are you still with me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, if I had three words to, ca to, to, to describe Baghdad, it would be roadblocks, traffic jams, and cement barricades, which we brought in en in masse. And so these are just some pictures to give you a sense of what Baghdad looks like. Amazing, isn't it? The next picture, I believe, is the green zone. Yeah, the green zone is behind this barricade. And the U.S. Embassy, the largest U.S. Embassy, is behind this barricade. And there's six, we employ 16,000 people, if you can believe that, and 8,000 security forces to protect them. And Iraqis would ask me, what are they doing here? At first they would say, you haven't gone home. You, um, the U.S. has not gone home, and they're the ones who told me how many people were, and I had to look it up because I couldn't believe it. What are you doing? What are they doing there? They asked me. Okay. The electrical grid. I, there is no national electrical grid ten years after the war, and so I was there. The electricity kept going off in the middle of the night you didn't you were with a family you could, were groping around 
but this is like an emergency <coughs> grid. There are generators in around, about at each block. Somebody who has a generator charges maybe fifty dollars a month to a family between thirty and fifty dollars a month to have an electric supply in case the national grid goes down, which it does. And it's a very dangerous system. You can see here, people die uh, as a result. It's not uncommon that somebody dies because of these uh, wires. Okay, so here's the traffic jam. Now, all these pictures were t outside were taken surreptitiously from a car moving car window. So it's not like, this is, I mean, this is the democracy that we're brought to Baghdad. Oh. It's not like there are tourists there or out in the streets or... You wouldn't want to be them. Uh, this reminded me of the sanctions. No potable water. They have to buy their water. Imagine. And this is a hospital we visited where six of the three children, three of the six children in this one room, for instance, were there with gastrointestinal uh, illnesses. And it just reminded me so much of, of when voices under the sanctions went and visited the children. Yeah, I think we need to, I'm sorry to be the messenger of Beta News, but we need to see these pictures. This is very recently, in, uh, just about a week ago, um, a, a Shia mosque was, was bombed, and, and then a Sunni mosque was bombed, and this was in a mourner's tent, and uh, two a car bomb went off and somebody actually got into the tent and blew himself up and, and, and this is what remained. Hmm. Um, I want to read you, if, if you're still with me, some of the messages I'm getting from Iraq. And I, I have to say, I opened email, Kathy knows this too, with dread. You know, like, what are we going to hear or not hear? So, death covers Baghdad this morning. I heard five explosions, huge explosions. Baghdad is a dead zone now. Today there are many explosions. Thank God we are still alive. All my kids now are very afraid. In the night when they are sleeping, they wake up screaming and hug me. They start to see bad dreams. My little daughters ask me each morning, please don't die like our cousins. We are living in our house waiting our unknown destiny. The militia had killed the father's cousins and his cousin and his wife in their car with their children inside. They had gone shopping. Every day we suffer from terrorist, another one writes, another friend. Every day we suffer from terrorist events plaguing our youth and our children. Death surrounds us in the markets, restaurants, cafes, and soccer stadiums. Recently a whole, a new style of killing started. Whole families are being killed father and two of his little sons and wife and little daughter. Their money and belongings were stolen and the car was burned. An Iraq army base was very close to the accident, but they didn't try to rescue the family. And in another place, two big families, 22 persons were killed, and these crimes are happening at night. And in the daytime, police are searching our house for weapons. We don't know how to protect ourselves. I'm almost finished, but I want, um, I sort of keep a tally or try to because people don't believe that we, because we never get the news of what's happening in Iraq. And again, we assume the war is over. Uh, and I'm just going to read you some headlines, if I may. Again, over 6,000 people have been killed in Iraq since the beginning of this year. Kids playing soccer among the 23 killed in Iraq. In Baghdad, a bomb targeting soccer players on a field left 12 youngsters dead and 25 wounded. A bomb on a bus in Hilla killed the driver and one passenger. Three women were killed in Basra and their neighbor was injured during a home invasion. 57 killed, 161 wounded in spate of Iraq bombings, bombings. In a cafe, 93 killed, 377 wounded in Saturday savagery. A bomb in a video game shop exploded, killing an eight-year-old and wounding three other children. A video shop. Forty-five included, including children in Baghdad Park massacre. Ninety-nine killed, 266 wounded in Iraqi attacks. Fifty-seven killed, 78 wounded as bombers move into East Diyala province. This is where a Sunni mosque recently was attacked. In 
93 killed, 183 wounded. Another mosque, a Shia mosque, where they were having a funeral. In Bakuba, a bar barber was shot dead, a teacher was shot dead in another place. I mean, such random, nobody is safe. Two farmers were shot dead. Sticky bomb killed a protester. We, when I was there, we had to look under the car for sticky bombs. In the middle of the night, uh, jarred upright by explosion very close. Uh, fake checkpoints set up, uh, and people killed at the checkpoints or kidnapped. A child on the street where I was staying, 12-year-old, was kidnapped never to, two months before I got there. Anyway, so I will end with um, just a thought. Uh, and again, it has to do with anger, which I think we many of us struggle with. And I heard an interview last Saturday with Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese monk with whom probably many of you are familiar. And I think he experienced the massacre of his own village in 1965. Um, and he's written many books. I only have one, and it's the one called Anger. <laughs> and he says we have a right to make mistakes, but we have to learn from our mistakes. And he calls us to look into the nature of our anger and to know where it's coming from. He said, those who came to Vietnam to kill and be killed are also victims of war. And he spoke of the need for a collective awakening. And he spoke of how understanding brings compassion and of wrong perceptions, he said, and that we as citizens have to strongly voice our concerns to our leaders. Um, everyone has a responsibility for a global policy, he said. We must wake up to the fact that only with understanding and compassion can we begin to understand people and help remove false and wrong perceptions. And it's important that our leaders recognize their wrong perceptions. And he said, I don't want my children to try to go to a place where there is no suffering. How could they learn compassion and understanding? So anyway, I, I just want to end with, um, I'm going to show you a couple pictures to end of a couple faces, and I'll just go quickly by. The children were so life-giving to me in this last trip. Here's some of the, their faces. But sadly, I, I'm going to close with that picture. Thank you very much.